On the afternoon of April 22, at our usual time, we arrived at the military meeting. I immediately noticed that it was as if a lidden cloud had hung over the atmosphere around us. The Fuhrer's face was of a yellowish-gray hue and as if petrified. He was unusually nervous, his thoughts were constantly wandering, and he twice left the conference room for his private room next door. In our absence at noon, General Krebs, whom General Wenk had appointed to represent Guderian, chief of the general staff, a few weeks before sent on a long vacation, outlined to the Fuhrer the situation on the Eastern Front and the sharply deteriorating situation around Berlin. Now it was no longer just street fighting on the eastern outskirts of Berlin. As a result of the defeat in the south of the Ninth Army, the Russians reached the area of Juterbach and directly threatened our largest and most important central military depot of the army. We had to prepare to lose it. In addition, enemy pressure was building up on the northern suburbs of Berlin, despite the fact that on both flanks of the Iberswald on the Oder continued to hold firmly Colonel General Heinrichsee. Jodl and I learned of our deteriorating position in the battle for Berlin only at the Reich Chancellery. The commandant of Berlin at noon received a personal order from the Führer to secure the central part of the city and the government quarter. Jodl held the meeting as briefly as possible. Army Group West had already been pushed back in southern Germany from Thuringia to Haars. Fighting was going on in Weimar, Gotha, Schweinfurt, etc., in northern Germany, troops were pushed back to the Elbe and the area south of Hamburg. At the end of the meeting I asked the Führer to speak to me in the presence of one Jodl. It was impossible to postpone the decision any further. Before Berlin became the scene of street fighting for every house, we must either offer surrender or at night by airplane to flee to Berchtesgaden and from there begin to negotiate surrender. I escorted everyone out of the office and found myself alone with Hitler, as Jodl was called to the telephone at that moment. And as was often the case in my life, Hitler interrupted me at my first words and said, I already know what you are going to say to me. A decision must be made immediately. And I had already made my decision. I would never leave Berlin again. I would defend the city to my last breath. Either I will lead the battle for the capital of the Reich, if Wenk can keep the Americans behind my back and drive them back to the Elbe, or I will die in Berlin together with my soldiers, fighting for this symbol of the Reich. I sharply objected to him that this was madness and that in such a situation I had to demand that he fly to Berchtesgaden that very night in order to continue to lead the Reich and the armed forces, which could not be guaranteed in Berlin where communication could be lost at any moment. The Führer explained, Nothing prevents you from flying to Berchtesgaden immediately. In fact, I am ordering you to do so. But I myself intend to remain in Berlin. I already announced this on the radio an hour ago to the German people and the capital of the Reich, and I have no intention of taking it back. At that moment, Jodl entered. In his presence, I said that on no account will not fly to Berchtesgaden without him. It is out of the question. The question now is not only about the defense or loss of Berlin and the command of all armed forces on all fronts, which cannot be done from the Reich Chancellery if the situation in the capital deteriorated further. Jodl warmly supported me and said that if their communication with the South will be completely severed, and the large cable in the Thuringian forest was already cut, then there would be no way to direct the actions of Army Groots Schorner, Rendulich, in the Balkans, in Italy, and in the West, because radio communication alone is not enough. The divided command structure had to be implemented immediately, and the Fuhrer must, as planned, fly to Berchtesgaden to stay in command. The Fuhrer summoned Bormann and repeated to all three of us the order to fly that very night to Berchtesgaden, where I was to take command, with Goring as his personal representative. All three of us declared that we refused to do so. I said, in seven years I have never once refused to carry out an order given by you, but this order I shall never carry out. You cannot and must not abandon the armed forces in this precarious position, especially at a time like this. He replied, I will stay here. Period. 
I have deliberately announced this without your knowledge, in order to oblige myself, if it becomes necessary to carry out any negotiations with the enemy. As it is now, Goring will do it better than I can. Either I fight and win the battle for Berlin, or I die in Berlin. This is my final and irrevocable decision. Seeing that it was useless to continue talking to Hitler when he was in such a mood, I said that I immediately leave the Reich Chancellery to the front to meet with General Wank, to cancel all orders given to him on his operations, and order him to go to Berlin to join the units of the Ninth Army fighting in the south of the city. The next day, at noon, I will have to report to him about the new disposition and Wank's advances, and we can think about further. The Fuhrer immediately agreed to my proposal. No doubt it brought him some relief in view of the downright dreadful situation in which he had placed both himself and us. On his orders I was provided with a hearty lunch. Before leaving I discussed with Jodel over a bowl of pea soup other necessary arrangements. He suggested that I take care of the high command, just in case the Fuhrer actually decided to stick to his plan, as he had just described it to us in such an emotional scene. We both immediately agreed that in such a case it would be impossible to command from the Führer's bunker in the Reich Chancellery, or even from Berlin, for we would lose all contact with all fronts. On the other hand, we could not leave for Berchtesgaden, and thus abandon the Führer, and lose contact with him. On this basis, I instructed Jodl to work out the necessary disposition for the combined command staff of the OKO, and the War Ministry moving to Berchtesgaden so that all units under the command of Lieutenant General Winter, Deputy Chief of the Operational Staff of the OK Dai, could be immediately transferred to Berchtesgaden, still remaining in Wunsdorf, and to provide operational command in the south, while the command headquarters north should be transferred this evening to the barracks in Krampnitz, near Potsdam, where we too with our closest assistance will also move. The general command, however, is to remain with the Fuhrer until a certain point, to keep in touch with the Reich Chancellery at all times, and as before, to hold daily meetings. Such measures still left us the opportunity to take the decision we had planned at the beginning, because we were determined to dissuade the Fuhrer at all costs from his obsession with the idea of dying in Berlin. Jodl undertook to notify General Wenck, probably by radio, of my arrival and of the order intended for him whereupon we parted. I left directly from the Reich Chancellery, accompanied by my staff officer, Major Schlotman, and with my never-depressed chauffeur Munch at the wheel. We wandered around Nauen and Brandenburg with great difficulty, for the other day they had been subjected to an air attack, after which only desolate ruins remained. The direct road south to Wank's headquarters was hopelessly blocked. Eventually, shortly before midnight, I managed to find Wank in a lonely forest ranger's hut. We were able to find this place by pure chance, for I met a courier on a motorcycle who first escorted me to General Culler's headquarters, and General Culler, in turn, provided me with a driver who knew the forest passages to the 12th Army headquarters. In a tete-a-tete -tete conversation with General Wank, I outlined the situation of the previous evening in the Reich Chancellery and made him understand that my last hope of getting the Fuhrer out of Berlin rested only on the success of his breakthrough to the capital and connection with the Ninth Army. I mentally went even to the forced removal of the Fuhrer, if necessary, and by force, from the Reich Chancellery, if we do not succeed in bringing him to his senses, which I believed with difficulty after his terrible behavior yesterday. Everything depends, I told him, on the success of our operation whatever it takes. Wenk summoned his chief of staff, and I outlined to him on a map the situation around Berlin, as far as I knew it for the previous day. I then left them alone, and proceeded to dinner late in the parlor of the Forester's Lodge, at which time Wenk dictated a new order for his army, which I asked him to take back to the Fuhrer. About an hour later I left again with this order for the army in my pocket, promising on the way back to place. Wenk's order in the hands of General Collar to instruct him personally, and to visit his division commanders tonight. I wanted to use personal influence on all these division commanders, and to convey to them both the special importance of the task assigned to them, and that, 
If it failed, it would be a bad omen for Germany. Wenk was, and remained, the only one who knew my innermost thoughts and my intention to forcibly remove the Fuhrer from Berlin before the fate of the capital is decided. At dawn, after a tedious search, I finally reached the command post of the division nearest to the front, which had already received the order to attack in accordance with the changed situation and our intentions. I found the divisional commander a little way back in the village, while somewhere in the distance the sounds of battle could be heard. I demanded that he accompany me immediately to his most advanced regiment, in order that he might exert his personal influence over the troops, and because I wanted to speak to the regimental commander myself. It was a division formed the other day in the capital from units and commanders of the Reich Labor Service. Naturally, it was not a battle-hardened unit, but its officers and soldiers were unusually enthusiastic, and their commanders were highly energetic and experienced soldiers who felt more than confident at the head of their troops rather than at the rear command posts, for only by their personal example could they compensate for the lack of combat experience and confidence in the officers under them. After I had convinced the field commanders of the importance of their task, both by my own presence and persuasive speech, I stopped briefly at General Holst's headquarters on my way back to Krampnitz. He was responsible for securing the Elbe River line, preventing the Americans from forcing it from the west. Holst and I, my old regimental friend from the 6th Artillery Regiment, whose enthusiasm and vitality I could vouch for, discussed the situation at length, and I particularly emphasized the importance of his role, absolutely essential to the success of the 12th Army, to which I immediately subordinated him. Holst was absolutely certain, on the basis of an avalanche of reports from the troops and from frontline intelligence, that the Americans had not yet begun preparations for an offensive eastward across the Elbe. At about eleven o'clock in the morning I arrived in Krantnitz, of course dead tired, and after consulting with Jodl arrived at the Reich Chancellery to report to the Fuhrer. Since we had received orders to report to him at two o'clock, I was able for the first time to take an hour's nap. In contrast to yesterday, the Fuhrer was very calm, and this inspired in me new hopes to reach him and persuade him to forget his ill-fated plan. After General Krebs outlined the situation on the Eastern Front, which has not become noticeably worse, and Jodl reported the situation on the other fronts, I confidentially reported to him, present only Jodl and Krebs, my visit to the front. First of all, I handed him Wenk's order to the 12th Army. The Fuhrer studied it carefully and kept it with him. Although he did not comment on it, I had the feeling that he was completely satisfied. I told him in detail the results of my talks with the unit commanders and my impressions on the spot. In the meantime, news arrived of the success of the offensive undertaken by General Kuller's Army Corps northeastward toward Potsdam. The Fuhrer inquired whether communication had already been established between them and the Ninth Army, to which I could answer nothing. General Krebs also had no reports on the actions of the Ninth Army, whose radio line was tapped by the radio room of the Reich Chancellery. Krebs was again ordered that the Ninth Army make contact with the Twelfth Army and clear the enemy forces from the area between them. At the end I again asked for a private conversation, but the Fuhrer said that he wanted Jodl and Krebs also present. It was immediately clear to me that he intended to put up the same resistance as before, only this time in front of witnesses. My repeated attempt to get him to leave Berlin was flatly rejected, but this time he explained his reasons to me with perfect calmness. He stated that the knowledge of his presence in Berlin instilled in his troops the determination to stand to the death and kept the people from panicking. Unfortunately, this was now a necessary condition for the success of the operations now underway to liberate Berlin and the subsequent battle for the city itself. Only one single force could still give some hope for the realization of this success, which was still possible. It was the people's faith in him. He must therefore himself command the battle for Berlin and fight to the end. East Prussia had been held so long only because his headquarters were at Rustenburg, but the front collapsed as soon as it lost the support of his personal presence. The same fate awaited Berlin. Therefore he would never change his mind. 
nor break his oath which he had made to the army and the people of the city. All this he communicated in a firm voice and without a hint of any excitement. After he had finished, I told him that I was going immediately to the front to Wank, Holst, and all the others to address the unit commanders and tell them that the Führer was expecting from them both the defense of Berlin and his deliverance. Without saying a word, he held out his hand to me, and we left him. Under some pretext I still managed to talk to Hitler again, shortly afterward, but this time in private, in his private office, next to the conference room. I told him that our personal contact with him could be interrupted at any moment if the Russians in the north broke through the front and cut communications between Krampnitz and Berlin. Would I be able to find out whether any negotiations had begun with the enemy powers and who was conducting them? At first he said that it was too early to negotiate surrender, but then he began to insist that negotiations would go better when we had achieved some local victory. In this case, the local victory should be the battle for Berlin. When I said that this did not satisfy me, he told me that in fact he had been negotiating peace with England through Italy for some time, and that every day he called Ribbentrop to him and discussed with him their future course of action. He preferred not to go into details with me then. I said that I would return from the front the next day to report to him the development of the situation. Then I left, not suspecting that we would never see each other again. I returned to Krampnitz with Jodl. On the way we talked frankly and agreed that to leave things as they are cannot be and discussed the possibility of abducting the Führer from the bunker by force. Jodl told me that such thoughts have occupied him since the previous day, although he did not dare to express them. Today, when they were in the bunker of the Reich Chancellery, he considered the reality of the plan and came to the conclusion that such a plan was out of the question because of the strong SS guards and bodyguards of the security service who personally swore allegiance to Hitler. Without their participation, any such attempts are doomed to failure. People like General Bergdorf, the military adjutants, Bormann, and the SS adjutants would all rise up against us. So we abandoned the idea. Jodl then suggested that we wait for the outcome of the actions he had taken with Goring. On the evening of the 22nd, he described in detail to General Collar, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, the events of the evening in the Reich Chancellery, and emphasized that the Führer had decided to stay in Berlin and either win or die here. Jodl sent Collar to Goring and Berchtesgaden to convey to him as quickly as possible the whole picture of the crisis that had unfolded. Now only Goring could intervene in this, since only he was capable of doing so. I immediately signed up to Jodl's action, and was grateful to him for taking the initiative to make a decision that I myself had not thought of. When we arrived in Krampnitz, our entire organization, that is, the operational headquarters of the OKW plus the headquarters of the War Ministry, North, which Jodl had merged into the Northern Command Staff, under his own command, was about to leave. The commandant, having received an unconfirmed report of reconnaissance raids by Russian cavalry north of Kramnitz, had already blown up a large field ammunition depot without receiving any order to do so and ordered the barracks evacuated. Unfortunately, I had no time to call to account this hysterical gentleman who had so easily destroyed Berlin's ammunition. General Wank had moved his army headquarters farther north and was already occupying another forester's cabin when I arrived at his place at dusk. He was trying to establish communication with one of his panther divisions on the other side of the Elbe, but without success. I insisted that he immediately and fully redirect his operations to Berlin and use his personal influence, since the Fuhrer's fate depended on this last battle and not on tank raids on the other side of the Elbe. A telephone call from Jodl awaited me there. He gave me the news that tonight he was unfortunately forced to evacuate from Krampnitz because of the proximity of the enemy, against whom he could only field two battalions of tanks at the moment. He therefore moves the OKW headquarters, ER operational headquarters, to a forest camp at Neurufen, between Rheinsberg and Furstenberg. This camp was originally equipped with signaling equipment and communications for Himmler, but remained vacant and suited us 100%.
I immediately agreed, but on one condition that radio contact must be maintained with the Reich Chancellery and the Führer must be notified of our move. I immediately realized that now to continue the daily military meetings in the Führer's bunker is no longer possible, because, most likely, tomorrow the enemy will take away from us the road from Krampnitz to Berlin. But there was nothing else left for us to do. Then I tried to convince General Wenk in the seriousness of the situation and in the importance of the task set before him, to refree the approaches to Berlin and then ordering him to personally report to the Reich Chancellery and bring the Führer into the essence of the matter. The same night I left for Holst headquarters and arrived there shortly before midnight. With Holst I discussed all the details of the task before him. Having weakened his rear, confronting the American forces, which were clearly not going to force the Elbe, Holst had to gather all his forces together and cover the northern flank of Wenck's 12th Army from any danger or real intervention of the Russians. At that time, it was still possible to re-establish the passes to Berlin through Potsdam and Krampnitz if 1. The 12th Army offensive would have succeeded in completely liberating Potsdam and establishing communication with Berlin. 2. The 9th and 12th Armies would have been able to link up south of Berlin. 3. An attack from the north, undertaken by SS Panzer Corps General Steiner on the Führer's personal orders, would have allowed him to break through the Berlin Krampnitz Road, an area not entirely favorable for tank operations. General Holst's only problem was to establish contact with Army Group Heinrichi and Steiner's tank group northwest of Berlin. If he succeeded in this, then, using the impassable Havelin Swamp, he could plug the gap with a small force as well. I assured Holst that I would give Heinrichi's army group orders to that effect, and that same night I rode back. At the first rays of dawn I passed through Rheinsberg, a quiet and peaceful town, and after a long search reached our camp at Neurufen, where Jodl himself and his immediate entourage had just arrived. About eight o'clock. The camp was so well hidden in the woods, far from the village and road itself, that only local guides helped us to find it. The painful realization of our remoteness from the Reich Chancellery and our dependence on radio communication and the telegraph strengthened my intention to take charge of decision-making. Unlike before, since I could no longer receive telephonograms from there. In the morning I telephoned the Reich Chancellery and spoke first to one of the adjutants and then to General Krebs, and asked him to connect me with the Führer as soon as he was free. Toward noon on April 24, I personally reported to the Führer about my last visit to the front. I told him about the favorable development of the 12th Army's advance toward Potsdam, and added that I intended to appear at the Reich Chancellery myself toward evening. He forbade me to come to Berlin by car, as the roads were no longer safe, but he made no objection to my flying to Gettau the airfield of the flying school, where I would be picked up. He passed the telephone receiver to Colonel von Belov, and I immediately arranged with him for my flight. I was to arrive there at sunset. I summoned my trusty Ju-52 from Recklin to the airfield at Rheinsberg, from where I intended to fly to Berlin. Immediately after this telephone conversation was held the first military meeting under my leadership, General Detlefsen, from the general staff reported the situation on the Eastern Front, and Jodl, on all other theaters of the war. We had not yet lost contact with all our formations, so that all without exception reports from the various fronts, as usual, we had on hand. Immediately after the meeting, Jodl by telephone reported to the Führer about my proposals and received his consent. General Krebs, Deputy Chief of the General Staff of the Land Forces, was at this time in the Reich Chancellery, and Jodl shared with him his innermost thoughts. That same evening I left via Fersenberg to the command post of General of the SS Panzer Corps Steiner directly south, hoping to clarify the situation there and the prospects for his offensive. Meanwhile, only one of the two Panzer divisions regrouping at New Brandenburg had arrived. The other was still being pulled up. Although Steiner had both made his way out of the narrow lake areas, and carved out space for the deployment of his tank formations, he had drawn the enemy's attention by his lunge. 
with the result that he had missed the opportunity for a surprise breakthrough, which under other circumstances would undoubtedly have been a success. As soon as I returned to camp, I had already to leave to fly to Ghetto. My adjutant had already arranged everything when I received a call from Colonel von Milov, forbidding me to take off before dark, as enemy fighters were preventing flights over Ghetto. I postponed my flight until 10 o'clock in the evening, but even this plan was thwarted. After a beautiful spring day the fog descended and the flight had to be abandoned. I postponed it again for the evening of April 25. Early in the morning of April 25 I left again for the front, first of all stopping at General Holst's headquarters, after he had briefed me on the situation in his corps, and Wank, who had again moved his army headquarters, had brought me up to speed. I dictated my own understanding of the situation to Jodel in order that he might convey it all to the fewer. General Wank had probably reached Potsdam with his battle group, but it was only a narrow section of the front, stretching in a wedge between the lakes south of the city, and he had no reserves and no additional striking power, since most of his forces were tied up by the increasing battles for the Elbe crossings. Without a map I cannot give their exact location, north of Wittenberg, so that he could not release them for an offensive on Berlin or for uniting with the badly thin Ninth Army. To carry out these two operations properly, the Twelfth Army was no longer strong enough. In this situation, I instructed General Wank, with all the threat of a front on the Elbe, to release at least one division for the main operation in Berlin and to inform the Fuhrer by radio on my behalf of this decision. When on my way back to camp, I was approaching the small town of Rathenau, about halfway between Brandenburg and Nauen. The road was blocked by German troops, and they announced that the Russians had made an attack on Rathenau, and it was under enemy shelling. As I could not hear any noise of battle myself, I drove on along a completely empty road straight to Rathenau. In the market square, a battalion of Volkssturm had dug a trench three feet deep, which opened before them a field of fire only a hundred yards to the houses on the far side. No one knew anything about the enemy except that an attack on the town was expected. I explained to the battalion commander the folly of his action, called the battalion together, made a short speech to them, and ordered the battalion commander to escort me to the commandant of the town. On the way I saw all sorts of artillery pieces, field howitzers, infantry guns, 37mm anti-aircraft guns, etc., in various places, arranged in various places in the courtyards, mounted on four courts and camouflaged against detection from the air. Their tractors and gun crews stood idly around them. The single gunshots of the enemy's batteries seemed to be aimed at the outskirts of the city. I found the commandant in a house a little farther on, as he was giving orders to the ten or twelve officers gathered around him. The commandant was an active officer of the engineers, and my appearance not only surprised him, but threw him into utter confusion. He told me that he had ordered the city to be evacuated and the bridges on its eastern outskirts to be mined, as the enemy would soon be on the offensive. I shouted at him that he must be crazy to run away because of a few volleys of long-range guns. Where are the signs of the actual approach of the enemy? Where does his reconnaissance unit? What are they reporting to him? And what is all that artillery doing, standing in every courtyard of the city? I ordered everyone out of the house and walked with them to the outskirts of the town where the enemy was supposed to be advancing. Nothing could be seen there except a few puffs of smoke from artillery shells. Under my supervision orders were issued for the defense of the town, the artillery was removed and entrenched, and their commander was brought to the command post whence he himself could survey the vast open space lying before him, where there was not even a hint of the enemy. I expressly told him that if he surrendered the town to a few cavalry patrols it would cost him his head, and that I would visit them again the next day, and hope to see a properly organized defense here. He should immediately send a courier to General Holst, and report to him of my intervention and the orders I had given him. I drove back to the line of retreat this brave commandant had drawn up for himself, and saw columns of retreating troops of various kinds stretching for miles, convoys of trucks loaded with rifles, machine guns, 
ammunition, and so on. Many of them I stopped and sent back to the city under the command of a few elderly military police officers, whom I selected from all the others. In view of the Haviland marshes and heathland to the east of the town, which afforded no shelter, Rathenau could not be seriously attacked from the east. But a vital line of communication with the northern part of Holst's corps and Heinrichs's army group ran through this town across the territory east of the Elbe. Up to April 29, Holst reported to me every day that all enemy attempts to capture Rathenau had been repulsed. Of what happened later, I am not aware of. On the same day, late in the evening, I returned to the camp at Neuerufen and once again prepared to fly to Berlin with the onset of darkness. Since Jodl had already informed the Fuhrer by telephone about how the situation was developing, I decided not to call him, but to report everything already at a personal meeting in Berlin. Unfortunately, the Reich Chancellery again forbade me to land in Ghetto, as it was already periodically under enemy shelling. For this reason the Heerstress, the thoroughfare from Charlottenburg Gate to Brandenburg Gate, had been equipped as a landing strip for airplanes, and Junkers transport planes landed there after dusk, bringing all kinds of ammunition requested by the Reich Chancellery and the Commandant of Berlin, as well as two battalions of SS troops who had volunteered for action in the city. So my arrival was delayed past midnight, so that I could still fly out before dawn. After midnight we waited at the airfield in Rheinsberg for the possibility of departure, but instead we received a categorical prohibition to fly, because the fire that broke out in Berlin covered the district of Tiergarten, with such a smoke screen that it was simply impossible to land there. And even my personal phone call could not change anything. I was informed that because of the smoke, several airplanes had already crashed and the runway was blocked. When I again on my return to camp began to discuss the matter with the Reich Chancellery, suggesting to them that I should fly out at dawn, I was informed that the Fuhrer himself had forbidden me to do so, since the previous evening at dusk Colonel General von Grime had been seriously wounded while landing his plane at sunset. I had a long and detailed conversation by telephone with General Krebs. He told me that Hitler had relieved Goring of all his posts, and even denied him the right to be his successor, because of the fact that he had asked the Fuhrer for authority to start surrender negotiations with the enemy. Krebs reported that on the 24th a radio signal was received from Perk to Skaden about his intentions, and the Fuhrer, infuriated by this, ordered his SS guards in Berghof to arrest Goring. He was to be shot. I was shocked by this news and could only say in reply to Krebs that all this must be some misunderstanding, since on the evening of the 22nd the Fuhrer himself said to me that it was good that Goring was in Berchtesgaden, since he would negotiate better than he, Hitler, would. Apparently, Bormann was eavesdropping on this telephone conversation between us and Krebs, for suddenly his voice appeared on the line exclaiming that Goring had been dismissed, even, and from his position, as chief gamekeeper of the Reich. I answered nothing. God knows the situation was too serious for such sarcastic remarks. I went to Jodl to discuss this new development with him. We now understood why Colonel General von Grime had been ordered to arrive at the Reich Chancellery at all costs, to assume command of the German Air Force as Goring's successor. That night I did not sleep a wink, because this last move of the Fuhrer suddenly revealed to me the terrible mood that prevailed in the Reich Chancellery, and also the power of Bormann's influence. He alone could have had his own nefarious interests in all this. He was using the Fuhrer's mindset to bring his long-standing feud with Goring to a victorious conclusion. What would happen if, as now seemed inevitable, the Fuhrer voluntarily met his death in Berlin? Did he consciously decide to destroy Goring along with himself at the very last moment? My decision on the evening of the 26th to fly to Berlin became even firmer, and there be what will be, if Grime could do it, so could I. On April 27, about noon, Grand Admiral Dönitz appeared at our camp in Nürufen. He had also summoned Himmler here by radio. The four of us, including Jodl, discussed the situation in a narrow circle, and then both our guests took part in a military meeting. 
It was quite clear to us that the Fuhrer intends to continue to remain in Berlin and fight, and that our duty was not to leave it as long as there is any possibility of getting him out of there. The fact that the Americans still had not attempted to cross the Elbe below Magdeburg, and the fact that there was a sufficiently strengthened front held by Schorner's army group, which made it possible to draw forces from the northern flank to protect Berlin from encirclement by the Russians from the south, as the Fuhrer had demanded, managed to make the situation, at least around Berlin, look more optimistic, even though the overall picture of the war was more than serious. We then bade each other farewell. That same night, I made the decision to give Hitler one last opportunity to choose. To escape from Berlin or to hand over supreme command to Dunitz in the north and to Kesselring in the south. The OKW headquarters, under the command of Lieutenant General Winter, assistant chief of the operational staff of the OKW, had already itself come under the leadership of Kesselring but both commanders had to be given full freedom to act as they saw fit. It could not go on like this. In spite of the fact that I had again taken all measures to prepare my flight to Berlin that night, I had to abandon the attempt again at the very last moment. I was told that to make any flight to Berlin and land along the east-west direction, that night was quite impossible. Not only transport planes, but also fighter and reconnaissance planes were turning back from Berlin. The city was covered with smoke, fog, and clouds, and even low-flying planes could not see the Brandenburg Gate. The flight of the new Field Marshal Grime had been cancelled. This was the state of affairs when I telephoned the Fuhrer with a proposal to change the command structure, but he rejected such measures as inappropriate, saying that he did not intend to transfer command to anyone until radio communications were broken. He equally rejected the subordination of the Italian Theater of Operations and the Eastern Front, the group of armies under the command of Schorner, Rendulich, and Lohr, Kesselring. Kesselring had enough to do with the Western Front. He would hold Berlin as long as he himself was in command there, and I must take care of the supply of ammunition. I did not demand that he leave Berlin, much less by telephone. After the departure of Donitz and Himmler, I went to Colonel General Heinrichi, commander of the headquarters of Army Group Vistula, to make a picture himself of the defense on the Oder, which he was in charge of the section from Scorfheath to Stetten. So far this front had been commanded by General Krebs of the Reich Chancellery, because he had been connected with the defense of Berlin. Now the responsibility for the defense of Berlin was removed from this group of armies and assigned to the commandant of Berlin, who, in turn, received all orders directly from the Fuhrer. For several days, General Heinrichi had been urging Steiner's Panzer Group and especially Holst Corps to obey him. He intended to use them at least as cover for his southern flank. Colonel General Jodl repeatedly rejected this demand, for the very obvious reason that Wank's army would become completely defenseless on its northern flank and from the rear. About one o'clock in the afternoon I joined Heinrichi at his command post in a wooded camp northeast of Boitzenberg, Count Arnhem's estate. Heinrichi and his chief of staff, General von Trode, gave me a comprehensive analysis of the situation, which had been made much worse by the Russian breakthrough south of Stettin, because there were not enough ready reserves to plug the gap. I agreed to consider whether we had the opportunity to give them support, but I again rejected the demand for the transfer of command of the corps to Holst, having made all my arguments on this point. In fact, I demanded that his army group Vistula was now definitively subordinate to the OKDOV and ordered him to send military reports directly to our operational headquarters. We parted like old friends, in complete agreement. That same evening, Heinrichi called me to report that the situation with the breakthrough on his front had become even worse. He asked me to give him at least one tank division from Steiner's group. I promised him to make a decision as soon as I talked with Jodl and Steiner himself. I found that SS General Steiner had ordered the 7th Panzer Division, which was still pulling up, to carry out its prescribed offensive only as night fell. I ordered this division to be on standby and remain at my disposal to deploy it in another direction if necessary. To give up the Steiner offensive, on which the Fuhrer had placed such great hopes, was very difficult for me. 
But in view of the prevailing situation on the Heinrichi front, when the enemy within two or three days could break through to the rear of Steiner and to the southern flank of Army Group Vistula, Jodl, and I were sure that now the only correct solution would be to throw the 7th Panzer Division through the gap from the south and into the flank of the Russians. I therefore released the 7th Panzer Division to Heinrichi, but with the obligatory condition that it be assigned the line of attack and its objective, so that I could pull it up again, regardless of the result as a reserve. This order was confirmed by Heinrichi. Jodl notified the Fuhrer of what had been done. It was to be a bitter disappointment to him. Early on the morning of April 28, at four o'clock in the morning, I went to SS General Steiner in the hope of finding there the headquarters of the 7th Panzer Division, or to ask him where it was. I also wanted to discuss with him how he was going to, and whether he was going to carry out his offensive even without the 7th Division. But it turned out that this division had been intercepted by Army Group, not even reaching the assembly point I had intended, and no one had conveyed this order to Steiner. After Steiner explained to me how he intended to resume the offensive after regrouping, even without the 7th Panzer Division, I drove back along the route I had established for this division, but did not see a soul. It began to dawn on me that either the division had been held up or was operating somewhere else. On another road I met detachments of infantry and artillery on horseback. When I asked them about the 7th Panzer Division and what was going on here in general, I learned that two nights ago the southern flank of Army Group Heinrichsi was rushing westward through the Schorf Heath and during this day, April 28, should reach the flanks of Fersenberg, where this artillery needs to re-entrench. I almost had a stroke. During our conversation last night, Heinrichsi, and a word to me did not say a word about this organized retreat, already then unfolded in full force. So the 7th Panzer Division was also somewhere else. And for this very reason, he was so insistent that the Holst Corps should also be handed over to him. At about 8 o'clock, I returned to our operational headquarters to confer with Jodl about this completely changed situation, according to which our camp, the next day at the latest, would be unprotected and surrendered to the Russians. I ordered Heinrichi and General von Mantufel to meet me north of New Brandenburg, and then left. Jodl first had a very tough fight with the chief of staff of this army group. During this trip to the north, I finally found the 7th Panzer Division, and after a long search, and the division headquarters. At this moment there was a liaison officer of the army group, a staff officer of the engineering forces, who was just showing on the map to the division commander the next stages of retreat and the distance of advance for each day. That was all I needed, to hear such a general plan of retreat of the army group, of which neither the O.K. Dalu, nor the Fuhrer, nor General Krebs even knew. This order was given the evening I left the army group headquarters, which means that by that time it had already been accepted. Its appearance, without the consent of the Okado, and even the Fuhrer himself, was the result of my sincere conversation with Heinrichsi, who concluded that the Fuhrer is no longer able to interfere in the situation, and that therefore he can do what he considers appropriate, and his main desire was to get his army group across the Elbe and surrender it to the Americans. All this I learned only later. From Heinrichsi's successor, Today I know that his chief of staff, General von Trotha, whom I dismissed the same evening, was the organizer of this general plan. Anyway, in accordance with this order, the 7th Panzer Army entrenched itself in a purely defensive position to reduce the pressure of the enemy on the units while they were retreating from the front, much to the amazement of the division commander, because of this way of using the tank division I went out of my mind. It was not intended for the humiliating role for which I had made the agonizing decision to take this tank division away from General Steiner at the very moment of his decisive offensive in the South, on which not only the fewer but also all of us had high hopes, especially in view of what General Wank had achieved with his 12th Army. After the division commander had reported to me the situation that had developed as a result of the collapse of the front, which was similar in monstrosity to the Russian breakthrough on the Oder, I convinced him that, as a tanker, defensive operations had nothing to do with him, 
and that his real strength was only in the counteroffensive. He naturally agreed, but pointed out that it would now take too long to prepare his division for such an offensive. In spite of his statement, I ordered him to use his weapons in the manner for which they were designed, otherwise everything was useless. About noon, I met Colonel General Heinrichi unexpectedly, in the presence of General von Manteuffel. Our conversation was rather strained, for I could not help reproaching Heinrichi rather harshly for concealing his plan of retreat from the high command and myself. He did not agree that such a plan could be considered a retreat, but said only that it was necessary to withdraw his southern flank across the Schorf Heath to the other side, and moreover, that all troop movements and actions were intended to shorten the front line, which was under complete control. That plan which the 7th Armored Division Headquarters showed me was merely an indication prepared for the engineer headquarters to mine and destroy roads if things came to a crash, etc. I then outlined to these gentlemen the general situation and position of Wenck's 12th Army, SS General Steiner's units, and Holst's corps, and described the situation in the north and northwest of Berlin, which had already become critical as a result of the unauthorized withdrawal of their southern flank which had seriously endangered the rear of Steiner's Panzer Corps. Heinrichi gave me his word to henceforth closely follow my orders and promise to obey the general command. We parted, at least outwardly, well, with my appeal to maintain our long-standing friendly relations and his promise to do so. This evening I was unable to return to camp before dark. In Jodl's opinion, the situation in the north of Berlin, on that very southern flank, was now more serious than before. I had a long telephone conversation with General Krebs, who was in the Reich Chancellery, after the Führer had transferred my call to him, so that I could not speak to Hitler personally. The telephone connection was terrible, constantly cut off. The Chief of Military Communications, who was in the camp with us, explained to me that now only radio communication could be established between the radio antenna suspended near our camp on a tethered balloon and the radio tower in Berlin. All telephone lines were cut off. As long as the radio tower was in German hands to transmit and receive signals and the tethered balloon remained intact, our communication with the Reich Chancellery would be assured. In addition, we still had radio contact with the communication service in the Führer's bunker. The next day, Jodl suggested that I evacuate our operational headquarters. At first I rejected this proposal because I did not want to risk further distance from the Führer, which would necessarily lead to the loss of radio contact. That our stay here would come to an end was quite obvious. Shortly after dark, a battery of large caliber guns opened fire directly on us and maintained a single barrage all night. During the evening, Jodl managed to contact Hitler by radio and report to the Führer the discoveries we had made about the Heinrichi front, and to obtain his full agreement with all my orders against any further retreat of Army Group Heinrichi, my order for a counteroffensive by the 7th Panzer Division, etc. About midnight I received a telephone call from Colonel General Heinrichi and very sharply expressed his displeasure at Jodl's reproaches to his chief of staff and stated that in view of the continuously deteriorating situation, of which he had learned from our conversation, he had ordered his army group to resume its retreat. I told him that his behavior was blatant disobedience for which there was not the slightest excuse. In that case, he replied, he no longer intended to be responsible for the command of the troops. I then removed him from the command of this group of armies and ordered him to transfer matters to the senior army commander, General von Tibelskirk. I told him that I had to inform the Führer of his resignation and ended the conversation. At that moment came in Jodl and began to furiously accuse the chief of staff of this group of armies, which he justifiably considered completely incompetent I had to speak out against Heinrichi, as we could no longer tolerate such actions. I told him that I had suspended Heinrichi, and he replied that I had acted quite justifiably. By radio telegraph I informed the Führer that I had removed Heinrichi and why. General Krebs confirmed this signal on behalf of the Führer that night. On the morning of April 29, the rumblings of battle east of our operational headquarters became even louder.
Overnight Jodel had already made all the necessary preparations for evacuation, together with the Chief of Communications. Only our movement to Himmler's headquarters in Mecklenburg, which was already equipped with the appropriate signaling equipment, was in question. Himmler readily volunteered to vacate this headquarters for us and to provide room for our advance unit. We were authorized to move there whenever we wished. Because of rain on the night of April 28 to 29, we had to lower the tethered balloon, so that for a time our radio communication with Berlin was interrupted. We could not get it aloft again until about noon, as its sheath was weighed down by the rain. On the 29th, however, the sun was so hot and the sky clear, and the enemy's air force was unusually active over our camp and over the front, which was now about seven miles away. As soon as our balloon was in the air, I asked to be connected with the Reich Chancellery. I spoke first to the commander of Greater Berlin, who was apparently in the Reich Chancellery, General Weidling, General of Artillery, formerly in command of the front on the Oder near Kistrin, at the time of the breakthrough of that front, came on the line. This was the same general about whom distorted reports had been passed from SS headquarters to the Fuhrer that he and his staff had hastily escaped to Camp Doberitz while their troops were fighting a brutal battle between the Oder and Berlin. Hitler trusted his general so little that in a rage he ordered General Krebs to see to it that this general was arrested and shot for showing cowardice in the face of the enemy. On learning of this, General Weidling immediately reported himself to the Reich Chancellery and demanded to speak to the Fuhrer. As General Krebs later told me, the conversation with Hitler took place immediately in the Reich Chancellery, with the result that the Fuhrer removed the officer who had previously been commandant of the city and appointed Weidling as commander of Greater Berlin with unlimited powers. He assured him of his supreme confidence in him. I mention this incident only to show how easily the Fuhrer's confidence in the generals of his army could be shaken, and how unreservedly he believed the slander of his secret intelligence sources in the SS. In this individual case only the firm stand of the general avoided a serious miscarriage of justice. Shortly after my conversation with Whiteling, there was a radio telephone conversation between Jodl and the Fuhrer himself, and I listened to it through headphones. The Fuhrer was very calm and objective, and once again approved of the actions I had taken. Then he said that he would like to talk to me after Jodl had finished his war report. But even while Jodl was conferring with him, there was a loud explosion outside, and the conversation was interrupted definitively. A few minutes later, the Chief of Communications came into the room and announced that our balloon had been shot down by a Russian aircraft. Since we did not have a backup, it was no longer possible to restore voice communication. Although this message completely shocked me, it helped me to decide to order the evacuation of our headquarters immediately after lunch. It was now out of the question to re-establish a voice line of communication, and a telegraph signal could be transmitted by radio from anywhere. I was furious that I myself had not been able to talk to the Fuhrer although Jodl had been able to discuss the most important matters with him. We sent a final message that we were moving and asked them to send all further radiograms to us at the new operational headquarters, where we would arrive this evening. Toward noon, the noise of battle became louder, increased activity of enemy aircraft, bombing especially the traffic junction at Rheinsberg and attacking from the shore of the retreating columns of vehicles blocking the streets. We divided the OK Audi into several marching columns and set each a different route. Jodl and I remained in camp with my immediate staff until the very last moment. My adjutant that morning had made a reconnaissance of the forest road especially for us, taking us on a wide detour around the villages near Rheinsberg and the clogged main highways. We left at 7 o'clock, leaving only the last communications units and the radio station to follow. The next day we learned from them that Russian patrols coming the woods would certainly have found us in the camp if we had lingered there even an hour longer. Only the communications truck and a few telephones had fallen into their hands as they had not had time to dismantle them. In this fine spring weather we rode along a narrow, hidden road through a dense forest, around villages and hamlets, toward Warren, to meet General von Tippelskirch and discuss with him the future operations of his army group. 
I was obliged to order him to assume command, as he had repeatedly requested me not to entrust it to him. I disclosed to him that I had already summoned Colonel General Student from Holland as the new commander, but that until his arrival he would be in command. From him, I learned that SS General Steiner had assumed command of his army for the time being. Handing over command of his tank corps to Colonel Feth of the OK Dog, who had originally been allocated to him as an intelligence officer. After I had thoroughly briefed Tipulskirch on how I wanted him to operate his army group, he asked to be relieved of his chief of staff. Jodel readily agreed to this after his quarrel with von Troff, so the latter I also ordered dismissed. We went to our new operational headquarters at Daven, the estate of the famous Dutch oil magnate Dettering, who died in 1939. When we arrived, we met Himmler, he planned to leave there with his headquarters early the next day. So the sleeping quarters we were given were cramped and overcrowded. But at least we had radio communication again, and we immediately set up a radio station, which almost immediately began transmitting radiograms to us. I received a message from the Fuhrer with his signature. It contained five questions. 1. Where are Wenk's advanced units? 2. When will they resume their offensive? 3. Where is the Ninth Army located? 4. Where will the Ninth Army break through? 5. Where are the advanced units holst? Over dinner, I discussed with Jodel our answer and wrote the first draft myself. Only after lengthy discussions, we passed our response to the radio post to send during the night. I was frankly straightforward and did not try to sugarcoat the gravity of the situation and the fact that it was no longer possible to liberate Berlin. The southern flank of Army Group Vistula had turned too far to the west as a result of their retreat, so Steiner's Panzer Corps was forced to halt its advance and cover the southern flank of that corps in conjunction with Holst's Corps northwest of Berlin, otherwise they would have been attacked from the rear or cut off altogether. All we knew about the Ninth Army was that about 10,000 men, without any large-caliber artillery, had made their way through the woods and joined up with the eastern flank of the Twelfth Army. They were not much of a reinforcement for General Wank, as his advance was hopelessly bogged down among the lakes just south of Potsdam. At the end of the radiogram I wrote, The liberation of Berlin and the resumption of access to it from the west is impossible. I propose a breakthrough through Potsdam to Wank. Or, alternatively, the Führer must fly south. I await a decision. Near midnight Field Marshal von Green, the new commander-in-chief of the German Air Force, arrived at Daven, his right ankle badly bandaged. He had flown from Berlin with his chief pilot, Hannah Reich, on the 28th and landed safely at Recklin. From there he rode directly to me to report the events at the Reich Chancellery. He told me of Goring's resignation and its cause, which I have described before, and added that the situation in Berlin was very serious, although the Fuhrer was confident and unperturbed. He said that he had had a long talk with him, but that in spite of their old friendship it had been impossible to persuade him to leave Berlin. Green added that he had been instructed to contact and discuss the situation with me. He would have to fly to Berchtesgaden on the 30th and there take command of the Air Force. On April 30 we remained at Daven. There was still no reply from Hitler. Received of my radiogram was verbatim confirmed to our radio post, so that in the Reich Chancellery it was received correctly and transmitted to the Führer. I could only interpret the absence of any reply to my last proposal as a refusal. At four o'clock on the morning of May 1 we left Daven. I took a hot bath and was able to sleep on a bed with clean white linen for several hours. The day before, the estate manager had evacuated all the property, leaving the estate to one of the butlers. The modern villa where we lived was next to the old castle, which had been converted into barracks for foreign laborers, run by the innkeeper's wife, even after our departure. She handed out a few bottles of wine each evening, but I suppose the Russians later drank the whole cellar anyway. I held a military meeting at 10 o'clock at the barracks in Wismar, where an active working group, including both the War Ministry and the Okado, had already been stationed since the 29th. Later, in all this disorder, I received Colonel General Student. 
He arrived at noon by airplane. I briefed him on the situation and turned to the tasks now before him, emphasizing the importance of keeping the ports on the Baltic open for our ships carrying refugees and troops flowing from East Prussia. Finally, Jodl discussed with him the orders to be issued first and how he saw their new manifold tasks. Stutt accepted command determined to clarify the situation and dampen the unduly panicky mood that prevailed. During our trip to Wismar, we unfortunately witnessed horrible scenes of disorderly streams of refugees, convoys of cars and convoys of food supplies through which we had to pass. Twice we ourselves had to jump out of the car as British planes fired machine guns and cannon from a glancing flight of the convoys. For hours on end we were crammed into a line of cars lined up in two and three lines, all in each other's way. Along with me in the open car was a remarkable military policeman, who by his leadership managed time, and again to bring some degree of order into this chaos and get us through it. At noon on May 1 we drove in several separate groups into the headquarters building, which had been provided in the north of Neustadt for the northern OKW group in the fleet barracks, where there was a place for everyone to work and a complete radio network had been set up. I expected to meet Grand Admiral Dunitz there, but I was disappointed. He and his staff were stationed in a naval hotel near Plon. I left Neustadt alone to meet him. It was about an hour away. In Plon the Grand Admiral had already held a meeting with Field Marshal Bush, who commanded the coastal front from Kiel to Holland, as far as I remember. Besides Bush, I also met Himmler there. He had arrived there to try to join forces with Dunitz. I have absolutely no idea what his true intentions were, but it seemed that he wanted to place himself at our disposal for further service and to familiarize himself with the situation. Toward evening, Field Marshal von Grimm and his chief pilot, Hannah Reich, arrived in Plon to join Dunitz. He postponed his flight to southern Germany for the day to discuss with Dunitz some requirements of the Navy to the Air Force. I learned from Hannah Reich that SS Lieutenant General Fagelin had been shot on the Führer's orders after he had been arrested by a police patrol in a Berlin nightclub drunk and in civilian clothes. I had a long conversation with Dunitz about this hopeless situation. He showed me a radiogram from Bormann that, in accordance with his will, the Führer appoints Dunitz as his successor and that the will itself is in the possession of an officer who has already flown to us. I immediately realized that my radiogram from Dobbin on the night of April 29-30 had destroyed all the doubts the Führer still had about the hopelessness of his situation, and that this will and Bormann's reassignment of it to Dunitz were the result of my radiogram. We were both convinced that the end of Berlin could come at any moment, although Field Marshal Graham judged the progress of the battle for Berlin very favorably on the basis of what he had personally seen and heard in Berlin up to the evening of the 28th. Deeply excited, I set off back to Neustadt, but was unfortunately delayed on the way by several heavy British raids on the settlements around the naval headquarters at sunset. I was terribly worried that my radiogram had painted too gloomy a picture, resulting in wrong conclusions being drawn. But in the end I decided that it would be irresponsible to embellish the unpleasant truth. My sincere radiogram was the only correct course of action. Jodel expressed the same opinion when I spoke to him about it after my return and told him all that I had heard at Dunitz's headquarters. That same night from May 1 to 2, Dunitz called me and asked me to come to him at 8 o'clock in the morning. At the appropriate time I left Neustadt. Tanitz received me at once and privately showed me two new radiograms. A. From Goebbels, with a list of the members of the new cabinet, supposedly drawn up by the Fuhrer himself, in which Goebbels was listed as Reich Chancellor. It began with the words, The Fuhrer died yesterday at 15.30. V. From Bormann, that this event had really happened, and thus Dunitz was succeeding him. So that's what it was. Goebbels wording made it quite clear that Hitler himself had ended his own life, otherwise it would certainly have been written, fell on the battlefield, and not died. The will, which was supposed to fly to us with the officer, never arrived. Dunitz immediately made it clear that, as the Führer's Harry, the new head of state, 
He had no intention of having a cabinet or list of ministers imposed upon him by anyone. I wholeheartedly endorsed this view. I informed him that I thought there was here a clear attempt by Goebbels and Bormand to put him before the fate accompli. In the course of the day an address to the German people and armed forces was drawn up. In such a situation it was simply impossible to swear in the entire armed forces once more. I therefore proposed as a formulation that the oath of allegiance taken to the Führer automatically transferred its legal force to Dönitz as the new head of state, chosen by the Führer himself. In the morning Himmler appeared again and spoke privately with Dönitz several times. It had already come to my attention that he did not appear on Goebbels' list of ministers. I had the impression that he himself, as if it were perfectly natural, considered himself a member of Dönitz's new cabinet. And since he asked me what his feelings were about the armed forces, I was prepared to assume that he had his eye on the post of Minister of War. I evaded answering, but advised him to discuss the matter with Donitz. I could not act over the head of the Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, and I added that I would ask Donitz to relieve me of my duties as soon as he had decided on the question of command of the Armed Forces, since at the moment it was necessary to select new commanders-in-chief for both the land forces and the navy. As soon as Dönitz learned that Himmler was here, he once again summoned me for a private conversation to tell me that Himmler had placed himself at his complete disposal, apparently experiencing in the previous days hopes himself to become Hitler's successor. He asked me what I thought of including Himmler in the cabinet. I could only reply that I found Himmler simply intolerable. We both promised to keep this conversation exclusively between us. Dönitz intended to appoint Count Schurin von Krosig, then Minister of Finance, as his personal advisor and foreign minister, and wanted to discuss the composition of the new cabinet with him. After the address was ready for radio transmission, I left Dönitz's headquarters and drove back to Neustadt with the intention of reporting back to Dönitz early the next morning. May 3. Upon arrival, I analyzed the new situation with Jodl. We both now had only one thought, to end the war as quickly as possible, while it was still possible to evacuate East Prussia and take action to save our troops on the Eastern Front. We decided to consider these matters the next day with Dunitz. A long radiogram from Field Marshal Kesselring, sent to us that same evening, May 2, for transmission to Dunitz, strengthened our decision. Kesselring reported that his army group in Italy had surrendered, which had already been approved, and added that he had been taken by surprise by the unauthorized surrender negotiations of Colonel General von Fiedinghoff and accepted full responsibility for it, and signed for the latter's action. Now that the Italian front had collapsed, the position of Colonel General Lohr's army group in the Balkans became perilously vulnerable, and there was no hope of saving it. Armed with this information, I went to plan on the morning of May 3 to Donitz. His own radio station had already received this radiogram from Kesselring. Donitz had also decided to end the war as quickly as possible, and so asked me to report to him as soon as I arrived. I suggested that the northern group of the Okado should immediately move to his headquarters. But since there was not enough room for this in plan, and the full control of the High Command had to be established without delay. Dunitz ordered that the High Command should move to Flensburg, and immediately, I summoned Jodl and our personnel to Plon, while the joint OK Gaudiwa slash military ministry organization left for Flensburg. After Jodl's arrival, we both conferred at length with Dunitz, who fully confirmed our own opinion of the situation. That same evening Dunitz left for Rendsburg, where he summoned Admiral von Friedeberg to personally inform him that he was being appointed as the new commander-in-chief of the German Navy. For the night we stayed at Dönitz's old headquarters, and on May 3 followed him to Flensburg, leaving at 4.30 a.m. at Flensburg am Merwick. Offices and sleeping rooms in the fleet barracks were prepared for us. Jodl, myself, and our immediate entourage moved into the same building as the Grand Admiral, our offices being next to his own. Jodl's chief of staff for the theaters of operations of the OKDA was now Colonel Meyer Dettering, while the chief of operations, General Detlefsen, ran the affairs of the war ministry. 
I do not wish to go into the details of the military situation. These two officers were in a better position than I to appreciate that situation, and no doubt they will both still write their own memoirs in due course. It will suffice to say that at once measures began to be taken to end the war in accordance with the clear instructions given by the Grand Admiral, while at the same time securing the rescue of as many refugees and troops as possible from the Eastern Front by transferring them to Central Germany. It was clear to us that when the time came, we would be required to surrender immediately and without further words. So there was still the question of the rapid transfer of those more than three million troops from the Eastern Front to the zone of American occupation, so that they would not fall into the hands of the Russians. This was also the subject of negotiations, which began early in the morning of May 3 or 4, at the initiative of the Grand Admiral, between Admiral von Friedeberg and the British Commander-in-Chief, Field Marshal Montgomery. When the latter refused to enter into a separate agreement with us, the negotiations resulted in an act of surrender presented by von Friedeberg and signed by Colonel General Jodl at General Eisenhower's headquarters early in the morning of May 7. Its only concession was the extension of the deadline to midnight on the 8th. From Eisenhower's headquarters, Jodl sent me a radiogram in which he conveyed to me, albeit in a covert manner exactly what possibilities this two-day delay offered, and I was able to inform the troops on the Eastern Front, and especially General Schorner's army group, which was still fighting in eastern Czechoslovakia, of permission to withdraw westward in an extremely limited time, not more than 48 hours. This instruction went out even before midnight on May 7. Colonel Meyer Dettering was able to assess the situation in advance, and with a copy of these instructions which we had drawn up, made a daring flight directly to the front to the army commander in Czechoslovakia. General Hilpert's group of armies, in the provinces of the Baltic, Courland, was informed by Major de Mazier. He was instructed to send home all his sick and wounded soldiers on the last transport ship leaving Liva. De Mazier brought me a last greeting from my son, Ernst Wilhelm, with whom he had spoken just before the return flight to Flensburg, Field Marshal Bush, Northwest Front, and General Boom, Norway, had already arrived in person to receive instructions from the Grand Admiral. We still had constant radio contact with Field Marshal Kesselring, commanding in the south in conjunction with the OKW OK Southern Group under Lieutenant General Winter of the OKW OK Operations Staff. Several members of the government arrived in Flensburg and Merwick, including the new foreign minister, Count Schuren von Krozig, as well as Reich Minister Speer and General von Troth. The chief of staff I had dismissed from the student, formerly Heinrichsy, Army Group. Himmler also tried to defend his vis-a-vis -vis positions with Grand Admiral Dunitz. After the meeting with Dunitz, I took the liberty of asking Himmler to refrain from further visits to the headquarters of the Grand Admiral. At first he was assigned some police duties, but he was also relieved of these. Himmler was completely unsuitable for the Dunitz government, and on behalf of Dunitz, I explained this to him explicitly. The following incident shows how little Himmler knew about the political situation and what a burden he was for us. From an unspecified headquarters, he sent a letter to me and an officer of the ground forces, who used to be among his staff, to give it to General Eisenhower. This officer was instructed to inform me of the contents of this letter. It contained a brief offer of voluntary surrender to General Eisenhower if he guaranteed him that under no circumstances would he hand it over to the Russians. Himmler had once before voiced such an idea to me in the presence of Jodl, during our last conversation with him. Since the officer who brought the letter never returned to Himmler, the latter never learned that his proposal was not passed on to Eisenhower, because we immediately destroyed the letter. Moreover, Himmler had ordered his courier to inform me, for Donitz, that he intended to retire to an estate in northern Germany. He was going to lie low for the next six months or so. The end of this story his arrest, a few weeks later, and suicide by poison during his imprisonment is well known. On May 8, after Jodl's return from Eisenhower's headquarters in Reims, the Grand Admiral ordered me, acting as head of state and supreme commander of the armed forces, 
to fly on a British transport plane to Berlin with the preliminary act of surrender already signed by Jodl and Eisenhower's chief of staff. I was accompanied by Admiral von Friedeberg as representative of the Navy and Colonel General Stumpf, the last commander-in-chief of German defense, as representative of the Air Force. In addition to them, I took with me Vice Admiral Berkner, head of the OKW Military Intelligence Department, and Lieutenant Colonel Baum Tatelbach, since he could not only speak English fluently, but had also passed his Russian interpreter's examinations. First, on a British transport plane we flew to Stendhal. There a squadron of British civilian airplanes of the Marshal of the British Air Force, General Eisenhower's representative, gathered there. After something of a victory flight around Berlin, we all landed, my plane last, at Tempelhof Airfield. A Russian honor guard with a military band was lined up for the British and American faces. From our landing place, we could observe the ceremony from afar. I was assigned a Russian officer to accompany me. I was told it was General Zhukov's senior quartermaster. He took me in one car, while the rest of my group followed me in other cars. We drove through Bell Alliance Platz through the outskirts of the city to Karlshorst, where we were dropped off at a small vacant villa not far from the barracks of the Engineer Sapper School. It was about one o'clock in the afternoon. We were completely on our own. Some time later a reporter arrived and took some pictures, and some time later a Russian interpreter arrived. He could not tell me when the signing of the Surrender Act would take place. In any case, I had been given a German copy of it at the airfield. I could therefore compare the version signed by Jodl with the wording of this new act, but I noticed only minor discrepancies with the original. The only significant change was the insertion of a clause threatening punishment for troops who did not cease firing and surrender at the agreed time. I told the interpreter officer that I demanded to speak to General Zhukov's representative, as I would not unconditionally sign such an insertion. A few hours later, a Russian general arrived with an interpreter to hear my objections. I believe this was Zhukov's chief of staff. I explained that I objected because I could not vouch for the fact that our ceasefire order would be received in time, with the result that unit commanders might rightfully fail to comply with any such demands. I demanded that a clause be inserted in the act that the surrender should not take effect until the expiration of 24 hours after the troops had received this order. Only then should the penalty clause take effect. About an hour later, the general returned and reported that General Shukov had agreed to grant a 12-hour delay instead of a 24-hour delay. He concluded by asking me for my credentials, as the representatives of the victorious powers wished to examine them. I would receive them back shortly. He added that the signing of the act would take place towards evening. At about three o'clock in the afternoon, the Russian girl served us an excellent lunch. Our patience was sorely tried. At five o'clock, we were escorted to another building and served evening tea, but nothing more happened. I was given back my papers and told that everything was in order, but apparently it was not yet known when the signing of the instrument of surrender would take place. At ten o'clock my patience ran out, and I formally demanded to know when the signing would take place. I was told it should be in about an hour. During the evening I ordered our modest luggage to be brought from the airplane, as the return flight we had hoped for was now impossible. Shortly before midnight, the time at which the act of surrender was to take effect, my aides and I were escorted to the barracks mess hall. As the clock began to strike, we entered the large dining hall through a side door and were conducted to a long table directly opposite us, where there were three vacant seats for me and my attendants. The rest of our entourage were forced to stand behind us. All corners of the hall were crowded and brightly lighted by lamps. Three rows of chairs ran across the length of the hall, and one row, across it, was filled with officers. General Zhukov occupied the presiding chair with representatives of Britain and America on either side of him. After Zhukov's chief of staff had laid before me the Surrender Act in three languages, I asked him to explain why the clause I had demanded had not been inserted in the punishment clauses of the text. He went to Zhukov, and after a short negotiation with him, under my gaze, came back to me and said that Zhukov definitely agreed to my demand and that the penalties would not take effect for the next 12 hours. 
The ceremony began with a few opening words. Then Shukov asked me if I had read the act of surrender. I replied, yes. His second question was whether I was prepared to recognize it by affixing my signature. Again, I answered loudly, yes. The signing ceremony immediately began, whereupon I was the first to sign the act, acknowledging it. Finally, my attendants and I left the hall through the door directly behind me. We returned once more to our little villa. A table had been set for us for the evening, creaking under the weight of cold appetizers and various wines, while in the other rooms a separate clean bed had been prepared for each of us. The official interpreter told me that the Russian general was coming, and that dinner would be served for his arrival. A quarter of an hour later, Zhukov's senior quartermaster appeared and asked us to start dinner. He asked us to excuse him as he could not stay. This meal is probably more modest than what we are accustomed to, he apologized, but we must accept what we have. I could not refrain from replying that we were quite unaccustomed to such luxury and such lavish banquets. It was noticeable that he was evidently flattered by this statement. We all assumed that this Sakusko was all that would be served to us at this hangman's breakfast, so we were all quite full when we learned that it would be followed by a hot roast of meat, and at the end we were served whole plates of fresh frozen strawberries, something I had never tasted before in my life. Obviously, this dinner was prepared for us in a Berlin gastronomic restaurant, and even the wines were German-made. After dinner, the transfer officer left us. Apparently, he was in favor of the host. I scheduled our flight back for six o'clock in the morning, and we all went to bed. At six o'clock the next morning, we were served a light breakfast. Since I was going to leave at about 5.30, I was asked to wait for Chief of Staff Zhukov, who wanted to talk to me about our return flight. We all stood by our cars and waited for departure. The general asked me to stay in Berlin. They would try to give me an opportunity from Berlin to order a ceasefire to our troops on the Eastern Front, as I had demanded the day before when discussing the terms of the punishment clause. I replied that if they could provide me with radio communication, I would immediately give the necessary radiograms. They should give me the German ciphers. The general disappeared again to find out Zhukov's decision. He returned with the news that it would not be possible for me to send these radiograms after all, but that General Zhukov would nevertheless still ask me to stay in Berlin. Now, I realized what they were up to. I insisted on an immediate flight to Flensburg because I needed to transmit from there as soon as possible modified terms of surrender to our troops. Otherwise, I cannot be responsible for the consequences. He should inform his general that I had signed everything in good faith and trusted the word of General Zhukov as an officer. Ten minutes later, this chief of staff returned again and reported that my plane would be ready for takeoff in an hour. I hastily climbed into my car with Berkner, Baum Tattelbach, and the interpreter. These gentlemen noticed the attempts made to detain me even more clearly than I did myself at least, not less. They told me that the Russians had evidently had too much to drink, and that the victorious feast in the dining room was still in full swing when we had safely departed. The interpreter asked me which road I wanted to take to the airport. We drove past the city hall, the castle, down Unter den Linden and Friedrichstrasse. Between Unter den Linden and Bell Allianzplatz, there were horrifying signs of fighting. Huge numbers of German and Russian tanks were blocking Friedrichstrasse in several places, and the streets were strewn with cobblestones of destroyed buildings. We flew straight back to Flensburg and only calmed down once we were in a British airplane and in the air. In Flensburg, we landed about 10 o'clock. We arranged to exchange official delegations with Montgomery and Eisenhower to ease relations between us. On Saturday, May 12, an American delegation arrived in Flensburg and was accommodated aboard the luxury steamer Patria. The first meeting was arranged at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Donitz was asked to be the first to arrive on board the Patria to receive the Americans, while I was to appear half an hour later. After Donitz left the ship, I was received. The American general informed me that I was to surrender as a prisoner of war and was to be taken out by airplane today at two o'clock in the afternoon, within two hours. I am to turn over my official business to Colonel General Jodl. 
I am allowed to take one companion and a personal orderly, and three hundred pounds of baggage. I rose, saluted briefly with my field marshal staff, and with Berkner and Baumtatelbach, who had accompanied me during this audience, departed back to headquarters. I said goodbye to Dunitz, who had already been informed of what had happened, and chose Munch and Lieutenant Colonel von Freund as my companions, thus ensuring them much less difficult conditions of captivity. I gave my personal papers and keys to Jodl, and instructed Shimonsky to give my wife one or two personal effects, and a letter for her to courier them, to Berchtesgaden. Unfortunately, the British later confiscated everything from the brave Shimonsky, even my keys and bank expense book, as well as letters to my wife. We set off on a flight whose destination was unknown to us, and after flying across Germany we landed at Luxembourg Airport. There I was treated as a prisoner of war for the first time and transported to the Park Hotel in Mondorf, which had been converted into an internment camp. Zeese Incourt had already arrived there before me. In Flensburg I was still my own master. Together with General Detlefsen I arrived at the airport in my own car, and in those two hours, completely unguarded, I could have ended my life, and no one would have been able to stop me. But such a thought never crossed my mind, for I could never have imagined that such a via dolorous was ahead of me, with such a tragic end in Nuremberg. I began serving my term as a prisoner of war on May 13, 1945, in Mondorf. On August 13, I was transferred to a prison cell in Nuremberg, and on October 13, 1946, I await my execution.